It's the cross ram breathing, fire snorting, eardrum deafening the eight that took America by storm. This absolute unit of an engine has powered everything from muscle cars to your muscly dad's truck. That thing got a Hemi? Yeah. It's a legend so strong that for the first time ever, we're dedicating an entire video to an engine. This is everything you need to know to get up to speed on Hemi Ram Charger. If you've been around since the early days of Up to Speed, you know that we love Dodge, and Dodge loves us. I got their name tattooed on my chest. They sent me a note when I was sick. Also, this Christmas sweater and these sweet Legos. And we all know that Dodge made the Hemi popular. But before we get into all the Hemi cars that we know and love, I gotta give you some history first. Good thing this is a history show. Hey, babe. No, no. Did you get lost? The cars of the early 1900s had no power, baby. <laughs> the Benz patent motor wagon made two thirds of a horsepower. Can you imagine two thirds of a horse? Gross. And if you wanted to go fast, the best way to do it back then would be to drive off of a cliff. The main problem with engines back in the grandpa days was twofold. First was valve location. Early engines used what's called a side valve design, where the valves live inside the engine block. The air fuel mixture enters one side of the combustion chamber and has to exit from the same direction. Because the air gas mix had to enter and exit the same side of the combustion chamber, air was restricted from freely flowing through. That limited power. The side valve design was cheap and easy to manufacture, so that was good enough for a lot of brands at the time. I mean, I don't blame them. Cars were only like four years old at the time, and everyone was happy with it, except for one company, Welch. Now, Welch was a small automaker located in Pontiac, Michigan. In 1904, they dropped the Model 4L, a seven-passenger car with a 336 cubic inch, four-cylinder engine making 50 horsepower. In 1904, so how did Welch manage to make so much power in a time when other car makers would struggle to make half that? Well, put on your engineering hats, you Ram Chargers, because it's about to get technical for a minute. They didn't opt for the side valve design with its flat cylinder head. No, the Model 4L utilized a hemispherical combustion chamber. This radical and radical shape completely changed how the engine made power, baby. The hemispherical combustion chamber increased the volume of fuel air mixture to burn while minimizing surface area inside the chamber. All of the new stuff that they needed to add to make an overhead valve train work made the new engine more expensive to manufacture, but the benefits were immediately apparent. Just like when my ex-girlfriend in high school showed up at my door with Nolan, I became immediately apparent. <laughs> And while Welch only built four Model 4 Ls, their influence reached far into the automotive world. Brands like Fiat, Peugeot, and Alfa Romeo were all experimenting with hemispherical heads. It's kind of interesting that Alfa Romeo and Fiat were playing with hemis, and now they're all part of Dodge. So I'm sure by now all of you guys are wondering, I thought this freaking video was about Dodge. When does Dodge show up? Well, I'll tell you. 1940, Chrysler had begun development on an engine for fighter planes, the coolest vehicles ever. It goes fighter jets, rocket ships, horses, NASCARs, Volkswagen Golfs. The engine they came up with was a gargantuan 36 freaking liter V16 called the Chrysler 142200 with Roman numerals. The engine was actually designed to run upside down, so when it was mounted in a plane, there'd be room for nose-mounted weapons. The hemispherical combustion chambers weren't enough for the engine to make power at 25,000 feet. At that altitude, there isn't a lot of oxygen to burn, so they had to find a way to cram more air into the engine. 
You see where I'm going with this? That's right, on top of a 36 liter engine, Chrysler also bolted a big old General Electric made spinny boy on the back. The end result was a maximum power output of 2,500 buff horses at only 3,400 RPM. While Republican Aviation built two P-47 fighter planes with the 1422 under the hood, the war was almost over by the time the engine was ready. Ain't that always the case? War ends right before we get to you school stuff. After the war, the Chrysler engine development team kept experimenting with the hemispherical designs. First, in single cylinder lawnmower engines, believe it or not, then in V6 motors. Those were either too weak or too heavy or too long or too wrong. Chrysler's next generation engine would have to be Yes, and the V8 engine. By 1950, the Chrysler team was hard at work, just in the lab, cranking on the new engine. It was a 331 cubic inch V8 sporting a forged steel crank, hydraulic lifters, and those sweet, sweet, war-proven hemispherical heads. I have a slightly hemispherical head because my parents left me in my crib too much when I was a baby. Hemispherical heads might be great on engines, but they're not great on babies. Make sure that you rotate your baby at least once every hour to two hours. Chrysler was on top. They called this little baby beast the Chrysler Firepower. Uh! Most power heads know it by another name, the first gen Hemi. The Firepower Hemi debuted in Chrysler cars like the Imperial, the New Yorker, and the Saratoga to wide acclaim, naturally. People loved the high-powered Hemis, and the success convinced Chrysler leadership to share the Hemi love across all of their brands. But instead of using the Firepower engine, Dodge and DeSoto designed their own Hemi engines for their cars. Announcing the new DeSoto Fire Dome 8. A 276 cubic inch V8 making 160 horsepower. This is your new Red Ram V8 engine. Ram Chargers! It made 140 horsepower. <laughs> By the late 50s, Chrysler, Imperials, and New Yorkers were available with a 392 cubic inch Hemi with 10 to 1 compression, making 345 horsepower. Get out of town! But even though the engines were great, it was getting increasingly difficult to justify putting them in passenger cars. I mean, having three companies design their own engines was getting expensive and their complicated overhead valve design, remember, was really expensive to build. So Chrysler axed the Hemi in 1958. An additional factor in the death of the early Hemis happened in 1957. The Automobile Manufacturer Association, AKA the Scrooge McDucks of the car world, banned all manufacturers from involving themselves in racing. Wouldn't you know it, just a few years later after the ban, Ford and Chevy started building fast motors again. What? I thought we all promised. They're like, you believe that little gentleman's agreement? Yeah, I thought we were all boys, dude. Yeah, dude, we're boys. It's not gonna keep us from trying to be the best. I should have known. I gotta go train. Ram chargers, roll out. <laughs> Enter Chrysler president, Lynn Townsend. The dude had two sons who spent a lot of time on Woodward Avenue, which was a street racing hotspot in Detroit. So Lynn's sons told him that his cars were kind of boring and that they got beat a lot on the street. Not really something that you wanna hear from your sons. He decided that the Chrysler family needed a total refresh. Chrysler engineers quickly got to work on a new engine called the B engine, or the wedge. The engineers did a great job because the wedge was a dominant force at the drag strip, but not so much in NASCAR ovals, which was basically the biggest marketing tool that car manufacturers had in America at the time. Lynn's race engine group leader, Tom Hoover, who also probably invented the vacuum, had a suggestion. If you wanna go to Daytona and go like stink, let's adapt the Hemi head for the wedge engine. And Lynn was like, you're crazy, man. 
You're crazy. They had 10 months until their work would debut at the 1964 Daytona 500. The team used the 426 cubic inch max wedge engine as the foundation. Now these things use crazy looking cross ram intakes and humongous valves to achieve superb airflow. The wedge boasted insane compression ratios, maxing out at an available 13.5 to one. Just hearing one of these things start up is enough to send your rivals running for the hills or make your little booty hole pucker. After 200 grueling laps, they got first, they got second, they got third with Richard Petty, the king, in the number one position. The Hemi was back. The engine development team also built a 426 Hemi optimized for drag racing. Obby is freaking <laughs> duh, it's what they do. In their quest of NHRA drag racing domination, Chrysler built turnkey race cars from the factory built to run in the 1964 super stock class. I wish I had one. New rules mandated that no fiberglass or aluminum bodywork was allowed. So Chrysler stamped the body panels for these cars out of super thin steel. Like imagine the thinnest steel you've ever seen in your life. Okay, you doing it? Thinner. And the weight shaving didn't end there. The interiors were basically stripped out. They made the intakes out of magnesium and the cast cylinder heads out of aluminum. These cars were known internally as A864 cars, available in the form of the Plymouth Savoy. In 1965, these cars were given the designation A990 and could be had as Dodge Coronets or Plymouth Belvedere's. Now, all this success would be pointless if Chrysler didn't make the Hemi available to the people. The Hemi street engine was tweaked for reliable everyday driving. The camshaft was milder, the spring rates were softer, everything was better for low RPM driving. But the valves, lifters, rods, rockers, crankshaft were all carried over from the A990 engine. This was a 425 horsepower race engine for your daily driver in the freaking 60s. For 1966, the Street Hemi was available in Dodge and Plymouth B-body cars like the Coronet, Belvedere, Satellite, and the Charger, if you can afford it, pal. The Hemi was an $1,105 option, which is the equivalent of almost $9,000 in today's money. When a majority of their cars were restyled in 68, including the beautiful new Coke bottle Charger, customers' interest in the Hemi was greatly renewed. I mean, these cars look amazing. And all that power? It's no brainer, dude. It's easy. <laughs> Throughout the rest of the 60s and into, sorry. Brody, come here. Listen your mouth. <laughs> the second gen Hemi hit its peak in 1969 and 70 when Dodge and Plymouth both used it to power their pointy boy factory race cars, the Daytona and the Superbird. These cars were so far ahead of the competition that NASCAR had to nerf them in 1971 for racing to be even remotely interesting. <laughs> Over in the NHRA, the Hemi Superstock Darts and Barracudas continued to f everyone else up. Something they still do today at the Dodge Hemi Challenge held every year at the NHRA US Nats. With a legacy like that, it's no wonder the 426 Hemi is one of the most iconic engines of the muscle car era. So how do you follow it up? Emissions regulations killed the 426 Hemi in 1971, but fortunately, Hemi fans didn't have to wait long for a new Hemi on the block. Unfortunately, the resurrected Hemi wasn't quite what they had in mind. The 1981 2.6 liter Hemi Available in the Dodge Aries and Plymouth Reliant was a four-cylinder engine built by Mitsubishi. And it peaked at 92 horsepower, which was a little short of the previous Hemi's power. But this tiny boy Hemi was technically a Hemi because it had Hemi spherical heads. Naturally, Chrysler sent that Mitsubishi Hemi away to live on the farm with my childhood pets. So the Hemi name lay dormant for 16 years until 2003, which is the same year that a little movie called Lord of the Rings Return of the King came out. Coincidence? 
In my line of work, there's no such thing. The Dodge Ram was available with a 5.7 liter Hemi V8 for the 2003 model year. The Hemi made 345 buff horses and 375 pound stirps to Turks. Those BV numbers had people all over the world rolling up next to Rams and asking, a thing got a Hemi? Yeah. Soon, the Hemi wasn't just for trucks. Cars all over the Chrysler family were getting the Hemi treatment. I'm talking Dodge Durango. I'm talking Chrysler 300C. I'm talking Dodge Magnum. I'm talking Jeep Grand Cherokee. I'm talking Dodge Charger. But this new Hemi was a little different than the Hemis of old. The heads were no longer half sphere shaped. The combustion chamber was much shallower and flat looking by comparison. There were still only two valves per cylinder, but now they had two spark plugs. The second plug now fired shortly after the first, which helped with emissions. The 5.7 liter Hemi might not have been exactly the same as the legendary 426, but it's still a freaking Hemi and people were stoked. But when the Dodge and Chrysler SRT8 models came along in 2005, they needed something a little I'm the power, baby! The 300C SRT8, Magnum SRT8, Charger SRT8, and the rest of the SRT8s were equipped with bigger 6.1 liter Hemis. Changes such as larger displacement, cast aluminum intake, and forged crank allowed the 6.1 to hit 425 hertz per the same as the old 426. The Hemi got another boost in 2011 with the introduction of the 392. The 392 had been available for years as a crate engine for race cars, but it went mainstream under the hood of SRT8 cars like the Charger and Challenger. The beefier engine now made 470 to 485 horsepower, far surpassing the legendary 426 while being smaller and more efficient. But you guys know that the best was yet to come. Thank you. Throughout this whole story, the Hemi has stayed naturally aspirated, relying on its big displacement to make all that power, baby. But what would happen if the Hemi was, I don't know, I'm just spitballing here, it's like, uh, what if it was supercharged? That's exactly what we found out in 2015 when Dodge dropped the Hellcat, a 6.2 liter supercharged Hemi, making a monstrous 707 hertz purse. <laughs> Chrysler didn't limit the Hellcat to Dodges. In 2018, the Jeep Trackhawk put all 707 hertz purse to the ground with all wheel drive. I've driven one with a bigger blower on it. It's one of the craziest cars I've ever driven. The launch, Dude, we pulled on a supercharged Huracan for two gears. Whoa! 104 miles an hour! You should know by now that 707 horsepower just wasn't enough, man. So in 2018, Dodge gave us the Challenger Hellcat Demon, which used a larger 2.7 liter blower that boosted power to 808 on 91 octane, 840 on 100 octane. We did a whole episode on that car, so if you want to learn more about it, check that out right here. I also drove one in another thing, and I also unboxed it. It comes with a freaking crate. Also, it's not even the craziest one you can buy anymore. What the f is going on here? Are there no rules anymore? Last year at the SEMA show, Dodge unveiled the most outlandish Hemi yet. A thousand horsepower, 950 pound feet crate engine for the price of $30,000. They call it the elephant because yeah, these dudes are the friggin' best at naming crap. What are you gonna call your car? I don't know, the Taurus? What are you gonna call yours? The Hellcat, the Demon, the, the elephant. elephant. The most metal ever. This seven liter, thickest thickety, thickety boy ever has an aluminum engine block, forged pistons, the Demon's valve train, and an updated supercharger. Dodge hasn't put the elephant in a production car Yet. I don't think any outro that I could write could be as good as hearing a Hemi one more time. Colby? Just like when my ex-girlfriend in high school showed up at my door with Nolan, I became immediately a parent.
<laughs> yeah. I love you.